Hello and welcome. My name is Liz and this channel, The Greenockian, is all about stories from the local history of Greenock and Port Glasgow. This week, we, this week, we are looking into a mysterious death in East Key Lane. In 1859, East Key Lane led from Greenock Railway Station, which at that time was situated in Cathcart Street, down to Custom House Key. It was a very fair, taking travellers from all parts of Scotland to and from the steamboats which left the quay to many places in Scotland, England, Ireland, in fact, all over the world. East Key Lane was home to, among other things, many lodging houses which catered to these travellers. On the evening of 17th March 1859, Mrs Hannah Armour of 13 East Key Lane who let out a room to travellers, opened her door to a young woman, seeking a place to stay overnight. Mrs Armour described the young woman as apparently well-educated, doll bonnet, and a profusion of rings. The woman gave her name as Mrs Janet Loudon, and said that she had come from visiting family in Dumfries, where her father was a farmer in Pernitsdale. With her was a young, fair-haired girl, aged about four years old, who she said was her daughter, Jessie Ann. The woman explained that her daughter had become unwell on the journey and she was stopping off overnight in Greenock because of this. Mrs Armour was happy to give the woman and her child accommodation for the night. Later that evening, Ning, Mrs Armour noticed that the young girl seemed very unwell and was vomiting severely. Having children herself, she suggested to Janet Loudon that a doctor be sent for. The woman said that this often happened with the child and that she was liable to convulsions and refused any medical help for the child. The next morning, Mrs Armour went to see how her visitors had spent the night. Seeing the young woman without her cloak, she noticed that she appeared to be pregnant. The woman, Mrs Loudon, also told Mrs Armour that, tired after her long day travelling, she had fallen asleep. But when she awoke, she became aware that her little girl had died, sometime between four and five in the morning. Being a kindly woman, and a mother herself, I'm sure that Hannah Armour was slightly perplexed at the woman's bear. Indeed. She was probably very surprised that a mother could sleep while her child was so seriously ill. However, practicalities had to be attended to. Mrs Armour advised her that she would need to register the child's death with Mr Robert Campbell, the registrar for the middle parish of, Green parish of Greenock. This Janet Loudon did, giving the child's name as Jessie Ann Loudon, aged four and a half, and that William Loudon, Draper, was the father. Janet Loudon also gave her maiden name as Young. The cause of death was written as Died Suddenly, Disease Unknown, and it was noted that no medical attendant had been present. Janet Loudon also certified that the place of burial was to be the churchyard of Dumfries, where her family lived. Janet Loudon told Mrs Armour that she would continue her journey to Dumfries as soon as possible to be with her family a coffin was procured from Andrew Crawford, who was a joiner in Westburn Street, Greenock, and the body of the child was placed in it. Janet Loudon informed Mrs Armour that she had heard that the fare for transporting a coffin would cost more than ordinary baggage. So in order to disguise the fact ordinary baggage, so in order to disguise the fact that she was travelling with a coffin, she would save some money by acquiring an ordinary box and the coffin was placed in this. She wrote a label giving an address in Dumfries, which was placed on the lid of the box. The young man who made the box, Andrew Crawford, offered to carry the short distance to the railway station, but the woman refused. A porter was called, who, along with Mrs Armour, accompanied the woman to the railway station. When he asked what was in the box, Janet Loudon told him that it contained chi China. At the railway station, 
A puzzled Mrs Armour saw Loudon remove the label from the box lid and replace it with another. Mrs Armour took a quick glance at the new label and noticed that it gave an address in Carlisle. The label read, Mrs Loudon, Bush Hotel, Carlisle. Hannah Armour saw Loudon take her seat in the train and that was the last she ever saw of her. I imagine she thought of her strange visitor and the poor little child often. A day or two later, the box arrived by rail at Carlisle Station. A porter, employed by the Caledonian Railway, named William Morrison, took the box to the Bush Hotel as indicated by the address on the lid. Miss Bishop, barmaid at the hotel, took the box in and paid two shillings to the porter, assuming that the owner would pay this on arrival. The box remained unclaimed and, some time later, it was moved to a shed in the yard, possibly because there was a dreadful stench coming from it. After a while, it was decided to try and find the owner of the box. Someone knew a Miss Loudon who lived near Carlisle, so word was sent to a relative of hers in the area and was asked to determine whether or not the box was this Miss Loudon's. The relative told the hotel management that her aunt was not expecting anything to be delivered and that the box was certainly not for her. It was then decided that the best option would be to open the box and try and find out some more information about the owner. A, new a newspaper reported what happened when the box lid was prized open. Inside the box was a coffin painted black. It was ornamented round the lid and bore a breastplate, the figure of an angel and the representation of a flower vase, all made of tin or zinc. The plate had no initials or marks of any description which might lead to a discovery of the parties who had sent the box. The coffin had also attached to it handles of cotton cord, which is not a customary appendage to the coffins of persons of the poorer classes of society. On the discovery of the coffin, the table George Bent was called. He decided to open the actual coffin. The remains of poor little Jessie Ann were inside. The newspaper report continues. The face of the child was slightly inclined to the right and the body had a resemblance to a mummy. The lid was put back on the coffin and it, with the box, removed to the police office. Dr Elliot and Mr Temperley, surgeons, were immediately called in and examined the body. Because of the state of decomposition of the body, all that could, could be determined from an initial examination was that the child was female. There being no other clues to help the authorities identify the child, the body was given a proper burial at Carlisle. Chief Constable Bent, determined to get some facts about this poor child, had photographs taken of the, of the coffin and box, and these were sent to police officers in Scotland in the hope that they could be identified. The incident became known as the Carlisle Coffin Mystery, and the grisly details were widely reported in national press, and soon the police were able to put together information about who to put together information about who the little girl could be. It came to light that a young woman named Janet Young had left home in Upper Nitsdale in 1852 and gone into service in Newcastle. She was reported to have been a good-looking young woman with dark hair. While in Newcastle, she became involved with a shopman who worked for her employer. The result of the affair was that she had an illegitimate child, a daughter. Dismissed from her place of work, she returned to live with an uncle in Ayrshire, until the baby was born. She then found work in Glasgow, leaving her child with relatives. In Glasgow, Janet Young, as she was known, met and married a man described as a tradesman, but did not tell him about her daughter until after they were married. The couple were just about to start a new life by emigrating to New Zealand and Janet was once again pregnant. She had to tell her new husband about the girl before they left. He refused to have anything to do with her illegitimate daughter. Janet had a dilemma. In order to keep her husband, she would have to find someone to take her daughter. Married, her family thought that she would take back the child, 
and had asked her to collect the child, as being older, they were no longer able to look after her. This she did, collecting the child from her family in Ayrshire. She then took the child to Hartlepool, where her former lover and father of the child now, li now lived. He had set up business there after leaving Newcastle about the same time that Janet did. He had paid some money to support the child over the years, but when asked by Janet if he would take custody of the child, he refused. Janet was alone with her child and no one to help her. Because of the resulting sensational publicity about finding the body and the reporting of the circumstances of Janet's life, William Loudon, a draper in Hartlepool, wrote to several newspapers complaining of the damage done to his reputation. He wrote, quote, Connected with the mysterious affair at Carlisle, a person representing herself as Mrs Loudon, wife of a draper in West Hartlepool, was mother of the child. Now, being the only draper in West Hartlepool of that name, I consider myself as seriously injured from the statements which have gone to the, gone to the public through your medium and beg most emphatically to deny the accusations on the part of my wife and myself, neither of us having the slightest knowledge of the circumstances. In fact, I can prove were it necessary from the most convincing evidence that she was resident in West Hartley at the time the occurrence happened. In desperation, Janet then went to Dumfries to beg other relatives to take and look after her child for her. They also refused. The family described the child as healthy, fair-haired, four-year-old. On 17 March 1859, Janet had been returning from Dumfries to Glasgow with the child, but of course had stopped off at Greenock when the girl became ill. When the child died at Greenock, she sent the box and coffin to Carlisle. She returned alone to Glasgow and to her, her husband. In April 1859, her relatives in Dumfries were surprised to receive a letter from her marked London. In this letter, she stated that she and her husband were about to travel to New Zealand. Later, they received another letter, this time from New Zealand, this time from New Zealand, in which she informed them that she had given birth to a son. She did not mention her daughter in any of these letters. It also came to light that a Mrs Hoyle of the Union Inn, Citadel Row, Carlisle, remembered a woman answering to the description of Janet, Lo Janet Loudon, accompanied by a fair-haired child, had stayed there some time in 1859. Perhaps this is where Janet had met with the child's father to ask him if he would take her. If he was from Hartlepool, I'm sure he would not want to meet with her there, where there would be a chance he could be recognised. Having gathered all this information, particularly with Mrs Armour of Greenock's evidence of the child being unwell and vomiting, Constable Bent's suspicions were further aroused. And in February 1860, William Carrick, the coroner of Carlisle, requested be exhumed. At last, little Jessie Ann was positively identified by a peculiarity of her teeth. The relatives who had looked after her said that she had previously had a fall which had chipped her two front teeth. Mrs Armour also identified the child by looking at a, clip at a clipping of her hair. Andrew Crawford, the carpenter in Greenock, was able to identify the coffin as one he had made for a Janet Loudon in March 1859. In late March 1860, Robert Blair, the Procurator Fiscal of Greenock, and Robert Hunter, the Chief Constable of Paisley, travelled to Carlisle to view the evidence in the case. The death had, of course, occurred in their jurisdiction in Greenock. In early April, the inquest into the circumstances surrounding Jessie Ann's death was held. Rumours abounded that evidence of poison had been found in a portion of the chat in the press. All reports naming the Paisley Herald as their source. However, According to the Greenock Telegraph, no cause of death could be ascertained in the case of little Jessie Ann Loudon. It would be up to the Renfrewshire authorities to take further action if they thought it was needed. And that 
seems to be where the story ends. But there are so many unanswered questions. It was very convenient for Janet Loudon that little Jessie Ann, if that was even her real name, died after being trailed around the country only to she was not wanted anywhere. Why was medical help not sought when they arrived in Greenock, as Hannah Armour, the landlady, suggested? The mother said that her child suffered from convulsions, but the relatives who had looked after the child said that she was a healthy little girl. Why did Janet Loudon change the address in the box containing Jessie Ann's coffin? Why send the body knowing she would never be claimed? And why to Carlisle? I wonder if Janet Loudon and her new family had a happy life in New Zealand. Did she ever give little Jessie Ann, her dead daughter, a second thought? I'm sure Mrs Arma, the Green Atlant lady, never forgot the little child was such an unhappy end. Thank you for listening. For more information about Inverclyde's history, then please check out the Green at www.thegreenokean.blogspot.com Thank you.